Welcome to the Church Safety Guys broadcast with hosts James McCarvey, Paul Buckner, and Mike Scully. Together they make up the Church Safety Guys, their mission to inspire, influence, and impact church safety teams. Join us for the next hour as we talk about all things church safety and security. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, join one of our church safety and security communities online, and share this broadcast with your church. Well, good evening and welcome to the Sunday night broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. I am James and I am joined by Mike and Paul. How are you guys doing? Hey guys. Good. How are you? <laughs> good. 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 I was trying to finish a text with all of the intro stuff going and I failed. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, if you are uh, if you are just joining us, feel free to to like and uh, and visit our uh, church safety guys page on Facebook and uh, subscribe to our content. And then, uh, if you're so inclined, you can also uh, visit our website at churchsafetyguys.com. And we do have a YouTube channel as well. Uh, that's the easiest way to to uh, watch past broadcasts uh, if you miss one and. Um, you can, if you're watching that, you can click like and subscribe uh, to that as well and be notified when we have have new stuff coming up. Um, so lately, I mean, we've, we've been pretty busy. We've got, uh, obviously, uh, you can visit our website. We've got resources available to, to you and your team um, on our website. We're, uh, we're now on Audible. We have our devotionals on Audible, so you can uh, take us in the car with you. At least you can take Mike and I in the car with you. I don't know if you, you really want to take Paul anywhere. If you really want to feel like you're being stalked by the church safety guys, turn on Audible in the car and you will no longer feel alone. Or you can take the Audible version of his pit stop maneuver with you. <laughs> you should put sound effects in the middle of it, like gunshots and screaming tires and sirens. That would cause That would cause misadventures while people were driving. <laughs> then we'd be the uh, church mishap guys instead of the church safety guys. Very true. <laughs> Very true. So it's not, it's actually, I have to, I have to be honest. It's not actually us doing the recording. Uh, we actually had someone on audible do the recording for us. Uh, and I can assure you they sound much more professional. <laughs> 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 at, at least with voice with, with, uh, with book voiceover. So, but yeah, those are those are available, and uh, and if you're interested, we actually we still have a few copies available uh, on Audible free. Um, they're actually review copies, so we're looking for some folks to uh, that would be interested in, in writing a review on that. So if uh, if you listen to it and that's something you're interested in, shoot me a message, uh, or you know you can email us through through churchsafetyguys.com, and uh, we'll send you the link for that. So um, tonight, I want um, I want to kind of go back to some basic stuff. We've had folks, um, new folks, join the group, and uh, I I want to go back and talk about ten steps to starting an actual church safety and security team. Um, and we'll tonight's episode might be a little bit longer uh, because of that. Um, and you're welcome to jump in and, and post questions uh, as normal. We'll try and get to those uh, when we can, but. Uh, for starters, I know Mike's got a crazy story. <laughs> I, I I laughed, I cried, I wanted to make some popcorn and be in <laughs> Texas today. <laughs> it was, I haven't uh, heard this yet. So no, yeah, this is uh, this is pretty interesting. I, I'd say is me mentally I'm exhausted. So if I feel off my game tonight, it's it's post adrenaline dump. Uh, I, I think at this point and. Uh, praise God, nothing happened. We had prayer warriors, including these two gentlemen that, that jumped immediately in to kind of uh, cast prayer over our church this morning. Uh, no active threat truly happened, but we did have um, kind of an escalating situation. Um, if you recall from a few weeks ago, we talked about a uh, kind of a doesn't look right, a couple that kind of felt like they were casing the place and their behavior just continued to create this pattern um, that just made them continually look more and more doesn't look right. 
And so we continued to fall, follow them. And this is also the one where the woman was carrying a children's backpack into church, but had no child and asking questions about the children's ministry. And again, no child. Well, it turns out that we have two services on Sunday morning. The first one, the uh, the gentleman of the of the couple, so to speak, uh, did attend, and he's entering um, with a bit of a jacket, and he's entering with a backpack, and so we don't necessarily have a standard to interdict a backpack and search them on a standard basis. We take them on a case by case and and kind of adjust accordingly. So uh, multiple of the team, great, they picked up on the fact that they were entering and this guy had a backpack. Hey, this is that. A couple other actually picked up on the fact of, hey, that's the guy from two weeks ago. And so you know what? They they start to recognize the pattern. So bravo there. That I'm glad the team recognized that. Well, he sits through service. He moves. He moves in service twice. So again, adding weirdness to his uh, behavior there. It could be sound. It could be whatever. But continuing to kind of glance around and almost take an inventory of what he sees. And of course, also scooting over uh, throughout the service multiple times, fidgeting with his bag. And I'm and we're just all instantly saying, okay, what is this guy going to draw out of that bag? And is he going to pop up instantly as a threat? So. Uh -huh. From that first service, it's about, okay, how do I retask my team so that we can position those that are carrying in closer proximity to that zone than say they otherwise would because of the, 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 the doesn't look right that's escalating. And we don't know what's in that bag yet. We weren't going to necessarily cut it off in the middle of service. Again, go through first service other than the odd behavior and keeping an extra elevated eye. Um, we really hadn't uh, got truly to condition orange. Second service comes around. He doesn't leave. He actually, and we're not quite at service yet. And somehow he got back into the auditorium after we had closed down between services. And so he was free with no overwatch, if you will, in the auditorium for a period of at least two minutes. And so we had to clear our auditorium. So our team executed that. We, we had the ushers kind of keep everybody out at that point. We hadn't officially opened for second service. And we're clearing that. Well, we come across a bag unattended. It ended up being ultimately that it was uh, a volunteer that chose not to put it in the volunteer cubbies and hastily left it in a weird spot. But again, the the, the kind of the, the cascading um, circumstances just had everybody on edge going into second service. Well, the woman shows up. Child backpack. Again, no child meets up with the guy and they choose of all places. They have yet to ever sit close to anything where we felt additional unease. But this morning they chose to go to the front row at the corner closest to the steps to the stage. And so it just literally is as if you're scripting a book just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So we're continuing to kind of say, okay, we're hoping these people just need Jesus, that they're here for service, that he wanted to stay twice because he loved the message, not wanting to see the evil in it, but instead see the good, but also mentally preparing for how are we going to respond if this becomes a threat situation. And so immediately kind of the, the focus of what I tried to do is I treated their positioning as the center of a bicycle wheel. And I positioned my team in multiple angle points so that nobody would basically be down fire from any of the team. But I ended up positioning it so we had three firearms within 15 feet of these people av having good angles of shot. Uh -huh. Then it's a matter of letting our, letting our lighting and sound team know. I said, if there's a threat that happens, if you hear, if you hear yelling, if you hear any sort of shot, I want full house lights across the entire. We hadn't really rehearsed that from a, a standard pattern. We talked about Smart. it in our theory, but sure. this is, okay, how do we get this going? We text the pastors to let them know, hey, we got a, We got an elevating situation in the room. This is what we would kind of truly classify as condition orange. Unknown origin, continued repeated pattern of, of, of weird behavior and their escalation to where they're choosing to sit at this particular service. So we cover most of that service and we're, we're again communicating across to the team. We're letting them know what's happening. This is a new one that kind of came to me on the fly. And, and it just, I, I say it's God wisdom because what I ended up doing is we had a, um, we have a photo team and they try to do social media photos and things like that. 
Well, what I immediately did is as soon as I knew these people are in again, and this is a repeat, they've been back. It's escalating behavior. Um, I spoke with that team and I asked them to nonchalantly get me close face up shots of the couple so that I can a bolo them in my office and B, if something does go off, we actually have full facial shots of them at that point. So praise God, nothing actually happened throughout the service except all of our team being fully on edge and them continuing to elicit that behavior continually through the service. So our team is mentally exhausted. We're going through kind of a postmortem of, of what did you see? What did you not see? What do you think happened? What do, what do you think we should do? Did we, not, did we miss something that you didn't see us do at this point? And we're kind of filling out an incident report that ties into something for tonight. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So really, uh, again, praise God, nothing actually happened. Everybody's safe. Hopefully they uh, had an a encounter with Jesus because of all the prayer. And you know what? Maybe they're harmless. But at the same point, their behavior says otherwise. So quite a morning. It, that's definitely strange. It, it's It was, I guess, the morning for DLRs. We had a guy come all the way in, big guy, come all the way into our sanctuary to the very front row and sit down right in front of the pastor and a very stern look on his face. And I'm like, red flag, red flag. And I position myself and there's two of us, thankfully, across and I'm watching him. And then he gets involved in the worship. Oh, OK, good. And then, and then he's really engaged in the sermon more and more. And I watch his body posture begin to relax. And he turns around to the woman behind him and she shakes hands with him and they laugh. And this was during the sermon, but they know each other. And I'm like, so I'm like, I'm like, you know, high yellow, orange, bottom of yellow again. And so that made me feel good. But because as a friend of mine would say, this is a full grown man. I mean, he's probably rocking 300 pounds and not obese, not even close. And then we had another guy that that his dress and demeanor immediately got one of my guys watching him. He catches me and says, hey, this is what he looks like. He went forward for prayer. And one of the leaders said, yeah, he wanted prayer because he has anger issues. And I'm like, uh -huh. well, praise God. But I really want to know what this guy looks like. If <laughs> if you pinged him at the door and, and every time you saw him, red flags were going off. And then he went forward for prayer specifically for anger issues. I would like, you know, inquiring minds. And then I stepped over to another security team member and he goes, oh yeah, I remember seeing him. And the first thing I thought was, boy, something's not right there. And I said, okay, that's too many. Cause he, I started to describe the guy and he finished describing him. That wasn't just somebody chiming in. Mm. And then I actually had a guy that was wearing kind of tactical gear. And I walked up and I said, Hey, he was wearing a, a pro, uh, a very patriotic shirt. And I said, Hey, did you spend any time in the military? You law enforcement? And he said, no. And I was watching him. And as he turned around, he's just kind of patriotic guy. I was, I was looking and he's not concealing a weapon, but I was really concerned because of the hiking pants and the, and the, the military boots and the way he was wearing that shirt. I wanted to have a conversation with him and make sure that he was okay. And that I wasn't dealing with something else. So it nothing to the degree that you're dealing with, but it must have been the morning for, for DLRs. It, it must. I mean, it was crazy. I, I don't know, James, if you had one too, but it was quite the morning. No, we actually, today was, was pretty, um, for us, it was pretty quiet, which was fine. I'm okay with. Um, last, uh, what was it, last week was Easter. And... Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's actually been two weeks. We had a DLR um, the two weeks ago, and uh, one of the officers uh, that attends our church he, he attends our church in uniform. Um, he actually noticed it and and uh, brought my attention to it. I was actually in another part of the building, and we pulled we actually pulled the guy out and asked him, and uh, the officer um, made the decision to. Uh, to frisk him um, because he thought he had a firearm on him. And so, um, you know, he, and it was, it was done privately in a way not to embarrass that individual, uh, which I really appreciated. Um, but discretion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was there. Um, several other safety team members were there uh, and, uh, and we had, you know, we had everything under control, but there was a lot of discussion in it and it brought, 
forward a good point. You know, any anytime something like this happens, and you, I know you guys will agree with me, it kind of opens your eyes to stuff that hasn't been discussed before. And so in this case, you know, I had several pastors come to me and they're like, okay, why are we frisking people now? <laughs> and That's okay. like, well, <laughs> you know what? The, the officer, I'm like, the officer came to me, he, he pointed out a problem. I couldn't disagree. Like I couldn't refute his concern. And I said, you know, furthermore, this officer has been an officer almost as long as I've been alive. So uh, we have trust, you know, we built over, over years of working together. We have trust and respect for each other. So he trusts me in directing his officers um, on church campus, I trust him when he comes and says, this doesn't really look right. Something's going on here. Guess what? You know, nine times out of 10, it probably doesn't look right. Um, but, um, this, this individual that we pulled out was just kind of socially awkward. And, um, uh, it, it was interesting because he actually su surprisingly, he had been getting ready to leave the church that day, like not come back. And he had made some comments that were kind of concerning. Um, and, uh, and so because of that, um, you know, again, it's just the perfect storm of, okay, what's happening, what's going to happen, what's going on. But in reality, what it did was because he got the extra attention because he was socially awkward, um, he appreciated the extra attention of being noticed, which, you know, wow. again, I'm not a PhD uh, you know, but there's, there's a psych lesson in there that I'm, I'm researching and trying to learn about because it's, it's almost like he, um, he was happy with the fact that we pulled him out of the service and interacted with him. Um, and you know, I don't know, you can, you can go multiple ways, um, multiple ways with that. And so we're just, as far as that goes, we're still still keeping an eye on it but um well before, yeah, so before I, oh go ahead before we go into that i just had a quick follow for that because right before i joined my church i've been there almost two years one of the deputies that that frequently stays by the door and i think i actually talked about this one night quite a while ago but he goes yeah he goes i had a guy that he goes talk about people that don't think about what they're doing he said a guy comes walking up to me and goes Hey, you should probably know I don't like cops and pulls a pocket knife out and clicks the blade out. And the guy, the guy looks down and the deputy has is defeating his holster to draw and it has reached down and is like, OK, and, and has kind of taken a preparatory step back with the intention of moving laterally. And the guy has pulled his pocket knife out undoes the, the the belt and he said I'm looking at this guy and he whittles a hole in his belt to give him a new notch in his belt and then folds it up and he said and puts it in his pocket and he said the guy had no clue that I literally had wrapped my hand around my gun pushed the hood forward and was about to defeat the holster mechanism and he said I'm standing there looking at this guy thinking I'm about to smoke somebody in a church and because everything I mean a guy walks up sternly tells you you should probably know i don't like cops click and you're like <laughs> and and uh he said and at that time we didn't have the the much more functional team that we do today and uh and so he began to talk to the guy and he said we actually parted on good terms but i i say that to say we live in very interesting times and having a police car in our parking lot hopefully close to the entrance is phenomenal but we also need to have somebody, if at all possible, that's helping keep an eye on our on our officer in case somebody walks up and goes, hi, and tries to stick an ice pick in their neck. Because if you wanted to kill a police officer, God forbid, but if you wanted to take a police officer's life, where are you going to find one standing in a dependable location predictably any day of the week? Mm. Well, probably well, in a church. And that's, that's one of the reasons why, like when we, when we direct traffic together, I, um, you know, I open carry a lot of times. And part of the reason is just for ease of access, because I know if something happens to him, um, you know, I'm the only other person around and, 
um, honestly, you know, with, with that individual that I was just talking about, it was the same thing. Like I bent down and I'm like, Hey man, what's, you know, what's in your pocket? What do you, what do you have down here? Cause he had his, uh, shoot me first pants on. <laughs> I'm like, dude, what, what do you got in your pocket, man? Why is it, why there's stuff falling out of your pocket? And I bent down like this, you know, I kind of leaned down to just tap it kind of joking friendly. Cause I, I knew the person well enough to do that. And as I turned back around to stand back up, um, the officer had his hand like it was instantly like he was standing there, you know, and he pivoted. And uh, so he did the search. And then I, I stepped back and had my hand where, um, you know, where where it should have been <laughs> should something come up. But, you know, if something goes, I mean, you guys know, too as well as our listeners, if something goes south and sideways, it goes sideways quick. Oh, and I mean, seconds of someone making a poor choice and it gets, it gets rough, but anyhow, we'll jump in, we'll jump into this so we can get, get through it. <laughs> um, so the 10, 10 steps to starting a church safety and security team. And this is actually, uh, we do have a copy of this in the case for church safety and security. So if you guys want to follow up um, or if you're like trying to jot notes down or whatnot, um, it is available in the back of that, uh, in the back of that book now. But basically for starters, um, <clears throat> you know, the first thing, if you don't have anything at all, the, probably the best thing to do is discuss the idea and importance with church leadership. And I know all of us have come across times where we didn't feel like the church leadership was really sold on it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's, that's like the hard. understatement of the century, <laughs> <laughs> but having the conversation and, and talking about them is, is where you want to start because even if they're not a hundred percent on board with the idea, um, it gets them thinking and it, it may take some time. You know, we've heard, um, we've heard of teams starting off as just a first aid medical type situation, uh, response team, emergency response team versus firearms and self-defense stuff and that sort of thing. And, and, um, you know, that's how we started our team was, uh, with medical stuff. Uh, and then we kind of graduated as the leadership trusted what, and we built credibility. We were able to kind of, kind of move into um, other other tools, etc. Um, one of the first things I always I always tell people is talk with your your church attorney or insurance team. And it's surprising to me how many how many churches I talk to on a regular basis haven't done that. Um, but it's important because your attorney needs to review your policies to make sure as another set of eyes that um, everything's covered well uh, from a liability standpoint. And your insurance company can tell you what, uh, what they cover. Like, for example, I can speak to Brotherhood and we have um, a, uh, uh, an agency that helps sponsor our broadcast um, that works with brotherhood mostly, but, um, I can tell you brotherhood covers, um, any, any particular situation where an individual is defending themselves and it doesn't matter what, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a firearm, if it's a baton, if it's pepper spray, whatever you're using to lethal, lethal defense or, um, you know, non-lethal defense, whatever you use, they cover you protecting yourself and other people in that building. So definitely check out, um, check out what your, uh, what your team or what your insurance covers. Go ahead, Mike. I think the whole thing of, of point number one is it's all about communication. It's sure. communicating with multiple parties and, and you're really starting with who are your stakeholders? Who would they be? Who are the leaders in your church? Who are the elders if you have them? Do you have a board? Do you have different groups? That's that's some of those people you need to think about contacting. The yeah. the others is obviously who, who can impact you from external. And that's that point with attorney or insurance. They're, they're consultants. They're subject matter experts and advisors that can provide inputs to your process, inputs to your decision making and planning. So the key here, again, is it center, centers around communication, and it's the foundation for, for the next set of steps. 
Absolutely. So the next, usually once that's in, in communication is right on, usually that's the best thing to, to, um, to establish. And with communication, what exactly, what does the team cover? What are their responsibilities? Because if the, if the leadership hasn't bought or, you know, bought into the idea and the concept, you don't want to be doing something that, the leadership doesn't support. So the leadership could easily say, Hey, just do uh, medical response and everything else. We'll, call, you know, we'll call the police for or whatever, whatever their decision is. The reality with that is that um, it's challenging. Don't, don't take on more than you should be responsible for. And I know for a lot of people, that's, that's a hard thing. Um, because, you know, we inherently want to jump in and try and help and get stuff done and, and do good things. But, um, you know, from a, from a principle of, even if it's, if, even if it's in regards to firearms, you know, if your church doesn't want you to carry firearms, there's several, most states have a law supporting that. So you don't want to be caught in a place where you're having to go back and forth, uh, legally because you know, because you chose to disobey the church leadership. Um, so go ahead, Paul. You know, you were talking about maybe, maybe your ministry doesn't have complete buy-in from your church leadership. And uh, a lot of times you've got to do these things in slices and, and getting, getting the buy-in from the ladies in your church to say, Hey, those, those young men and young women are doing such a good job and they start following up the pastor and start complimenting. If you ever get uh, someone who says, thank you so much for helping me find my son, my daughter, thank you for escorting us out when we were having our custody issue. Anybody thanks you. Uh, I know it comes off self-serving, but if they will throw that on a card and give it to you and you can pass it off to your leadership, um, it opened the keys to the castle for me several times, literally where where they were like, wow, we didn't even know this was going on. And I'm like, I'm, I'm passing you off monthly reports, but it made it real. Number one, number two, right. a lot of times in churches, we go through situations where like, I had a member of my leadership at my last church that we went through a season of, he's like, well, you guys have responsibility for the outside of the church. And actually before that, he told us, if anybody does something bad on the outside of the church, you hold them at gunpoint and you let me tell you whether to shoot them or not. And I'm like, what? I'm like, first off, if it's coming out, it's bad. And there's like a half a percent chance that's ever happening. But if if it happens, it's going to happen. I'm not going to go, wait, 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 hold on. Let me get one of my pastors really quick. That doesn't work that way. I said, it can't work that way. And I, I think what he was afraid of was we would overreact. And so we... Yeah. We built relationships over time where they began to see us uh, faithful over a little. And then they realized we're, we're writing blank checks with our lives. And we're not a bunch of cowboys out there going, I wish somebody dry this Sunday. And and then the, the other aspect we went through was he actually gave us uh, permission to control the wire. He gave us the outside of the building and said, but if anything happens inside, I'm responsible for it. Don't do anything unless I tell you. And I'm like, you don't understand it. We have to be responsible for safety. Give us the criteria you want and we'll build off of it. And I think I share that because things work in steps, building trust, building relationships. I mean, James and I, you and I, some of the first conversations we had were about building trust with our leadership. And, and hopefully this resonates with people at home listening to go, Oh, thank God. I'm not the only one that doesn't have 100% buy-in or, or, you know, and, and hopefully it helps them to see and, and go, okay, this too shall pass. For sure. Yep. Moving on to number two, I'd, I'd say uh, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of be a little bit punny here uh, for you, Paul. Uh -oh. um, we're going to bring it in and, and say that number two is first, you need to gauge the interest of the folks in your church that may want to participate in the team. And you also have to then determine interview questions to make sure you have the right caliber of people. Ooh. <laughs> Once you load them in, no, never mind. <laughs> no. And, and that's something, I mean, honestly, we could spend a whole show on interviewing questions and, oh, man. and talking about, having a meeting and whatnot. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a topic for, for further discussion uh, down the, 
down the road. But yeah, um, establishing ahead of time, establishing a, uh, a policy on or process for interviewing folks and, and figuring out who's, who's capable, who's interested in setting those standards is a good, is a good thing. Um, you know, it gives you the opportunity to develop pet peeves. Like when someone comes up to me and says, Hey, I want to join the safety team. Do I get a gun? <laughs> pew, pew. Actually, so. I had a guy do that. I, I just posted about that in a video recently again, that his first Sunday, the only time he ever came to church, he wanted to know who the head of security was. And no one thought that was disturbing and brought them right up to me. And then he's like, Hey, I want to join your security team and carry a gun. And, I, and I'm like, red flags. And uh, I came up with some stuff off the cuff. Well, you really need to be a member about a year. We really need to get to know you better. Oh, okay. I'll find a different church. And he left. And I was like, but one of the things that I find interesting is some churches are doing a very interesting thing with plugging people into ministries who've not yet given their life to the Lord. Um, our church does that with our parking lot, with our, with our cafe area, with uh, some of our door greeters. And it's really an interesting way to get people involved and then they can ask questions as they build relationships. So let me, let me, let me bracket that. The security team is not the place to park people who are not saved and in vibrant life changing relationships with the Lord because dirty Harry or dirty Harriet should probably not be on the church safety team. Or even with a little bit of military background, or even if they, um, they're a nurse or they have medical experience, just because they bring those to the table doesn't mean, again, they're the right caliber. Right. Copy that. Well, and that's, you know, as much as, I mean, I, I work, obviously, and you guys know this, I work with the military, um, but I, I know that not every person that was in the military is an expert marksman. You know, not every person... Um, you know, has uh, ordinance training, right? So, um, interesting stuff. So, number three, we'll move on. Uh, decide the best location to plant, plant or place resources for each service or event. Um, you know, and again, you can um, you can think through the stream of folks in your church, but obviously. Um, we're very much in favor of um, an outlying and kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to say cyclical pattern, but um, kind of like a bullseye pattern. You know, you start with an outside layer in, in the parking lot and then you work your way in and determine what, what can be, um, you know, what can be beneficial what is absolute necessary and, you know, and talk to, talk to the pastors about that. My pastors have made it very clear to me that children's ministries are the highest priority. So when I look at where we, we put folks and chat with other churches about it, often I, I will say that I'll say, okay, well, you know what, here's, here's how the general funnel of people come in through the building and this is where we need folks. And, um, and that also gives you the opportunity to do a, an outside assessment of the building and have somebody else come in and say, okay, this is what you're seeing. This is what, you know, um, this is where some of your, your shortcomings are, et cetera. Positionally, I think that's uh, one of the easiest thing to start focusing on is where do you need to position folks? And that has tie into the story that I shared at the beginning of the show uh, this morning is that we have positions, but given the fact that these folks chose to position themselves in a certain area, we had to adapt on the fly. And what that meant is quickly utilizing our communications, adapting and our teams being ready to be able to rotate or move to cover different positions. So I rotated and moved resources again, in this case, those that were carrying and made sure that those who were carrying not only were in better proximity to the elevated risk, but also were not going to be positioned in such a way that they might be in a bad spot from, from not only the threat, but from each other to make sure that they didn't create crossfire situations to even notify, hey, you know what, our sound guy who also carries, but he's not on our safety team. Hey, Mr. Sound Guy, FY, if this, go, if this happens, 
I'm crossing down this aisle. I'm going to be crossing through your line of fire. Please don't shoot me. Okay. So the idea is, again, think about what where that is. Think about where those positions are to be. But don't be so locked in that you think that you don't have others or that you can't be on a rotating basis. We, we like, I like when we have the opportunity to set folks up where they're just far enough away to not be in people's, like in each other's hair in a sense, but at the same time, you know, yeah, I was thinking of you when I said that, Paul. <laughs> it is very difficult to get into my hair, just saying. But at the same time, be close enough where, you know, maybe 20 feet away, you could shout and somebody would hear it enough to get their attention to say, hey, I need help. Or, you know, on the radio that that adds, you know, that adds clarity too. were you going to add something, Paul? Yeah, because I, I love what Mike was talking about. Um, I have a friend, <clears throat> large church, thousand plus members. They had a guy come in and he was a firm doesn't look right. And we've adopted even unconsciously a lot of this. I think a lot of churches do. But he was enough of a DLR. They talked to him. He was acting kind of funny. Well, they have a heavy hitter on their team who's one of the most dangerous, godly men that I know. And uh, you could not pay me for four of me to fight that guy. And uh, so as an off-duty member of law enforcement and in a very capable instructor, he goes up and sits right behind this guy. And so the guy's a very firm DLR. You can tell he's got some setbacks. And what they're hoping is he'll hear, hear the gospel. So they engage him. They visit with him. Well, then when they're like, well, everybody stand for worship, um, he stands up and sits down. And then if you guys will take a seat during announcements, he goes to sit bolt upright. And the guy, the officer leans forward and taps him and says, hey, brother, would you sit down for me? And so then the guy takes off his shoes and it smells, I mean, his feet smell terrible. So he leans forward and says, hey, brother, can you put your shoes back on for me? And then when the pastor gets ready to speak and as the pastor's walking up to speak, the guy stands bolt upright and starts to make a beeline for the stage. Well, guess who was within touching distance the whole time? And so had the guy tried to pull something out that was some kind of a distance weapon or or make a lunge, this guy was all over him. And so the gentleman just put him in a very simple arm bar and, uh, and it actually looked like he was just taking his arm to escort him out. It was very well done. And he just turned him in a circle and escorted him out the back door. And he said, I think it's time for you to leave because the guy was determined to interrupt the service and he was waiting for his moment. And I mean, very much like uh, Jesus with uh, in the synagogue teaching and the, and the demonically possessed man stood up and interrupted his preaching. And so I love what you guys did, Mike, because you had people positioned in a way that if they started pulling things out of their backpacks that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you thought about Crossfire. And I love the fact that you were like, oh, my sound guy has uh, I and I even commented in our private messaging that there was a gold nugget there because not only did you talk to the sound guy and say, hey, don't shoot me, uh, I'm going to be crossing over through here, but you even said raise the house lights. And so if your team yeah. was ready for that and they weren't ready for that, if they thought maybe if the house lights were low, they could do something bad, well, surprise, and anything you can do that sets the bad guy on their heel so I, I think anybody listening at home should jot that down, uh, be, be having conversations with your with your team. And that way, I mean, we had a seizure a couple of months ago at my church where a lady had it. It was a it was a powerful seizure and they can they can raise individual lights. And as the medical team was rushing up there, I probably should talk to our our leadership and say, hey, that's something I wouldn't have thought of. Can you can you drop a spot on us and give us lots of light? So that's that's solid stuff, Mike. For sure. So number four, um, we'll keep moving here. So uh, typically what, what I suggest is lock the doors after the service uh, starts and kind of funnel funnel people through one, one regular path. Um, you know, that necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily um, stop a threat from coming to the church. But, you know, if you can deter someone long enough, if, you know, if somebody's in that habit of, of being deterred quickly or easily by, you know, pulling on a door that's locked and then they go to another door, that just gives you that buys more time. And if they are intending on doing something um, that's unauthorized entry for that side of the building or that location, it will slow them down a little bit. Um, and that 
that time, that break of time might just be enough, you know, to, to, um, you know, to, to respond or buy you time to respond. So I've got two quick thoughts on that because yeah. that resonates with me, even aside from an act of killer coming to your church, which is what, which is what people focus on because that's the, that's the, the elephant in the room. But um, how, how many of us that have stuff have had stuff stolen from our churches during service times? I know of several churches where people would come up and this is from Arkansas, which is just south of me up through my area in a corridor. We're along a major corridor and we would have where the, the choir door was left unlocked and people came in and I picture them with a garbage bag and they're emptying the contents of purses and wallets and some of these older churches, they've got massive choirs. And so folks would have, they would go change into their robes and they would have a chair, which is a thief's dream come true. And here's a purse and here's a guy's jeans with his wallet laying on top of it. And they, they literally got robbed blind. Or I know of a church and I mentioned this uh, recently, um, it's a denomination and I won't name it for out of respect to the denomination, but they have had an ongoing concern where somebody knows their schedule, knows their parlance, how they speak. And this individual is sexually assaulting children. This is a this is a serial child molester. And they come into the church right when the two services overlap and they come up to a child and they say, now these are doors that are unlocked all over the campus. And they come up and say, oh, hi, little child. I'm your new, and they name their title, and these kids are, are raised in this environment. They know what that means. We need to spend about five minutes getting ready for next Sunday when I'm going to be your new name of function. And then they molest these people's kids. And this has been going on for a couple of years. And this is where locking down and funneling, well, now when that person walks in the door, especially if you have cameras, especially if you're looking for DLRs, people are going to remember what this person looks like. And so... I love what you just said about that, James. Well, and you don't have to, if you have somebody and, and I've, I've had pushback from churches before on that, where they're, they're like, well, you know, we need to be open. We need to be welcoming. Well, policies and procedures are opening and welcoming. You know, if I have a safety person at that door and they don't look, that person doesn't look threatening by all means, open the door and let them in. If, if, the, if it's a member that they know that they can identify, um, but having a process to it, when we funnel people through the main entrance, we are also funneling them. If they're new folks to the church, we're also funneling them to individuals that can register their kids or, you know, yes. get them information that they need versus coming in a random door. I mean, our, our, um, our church has 24 external, external doors. So if you've never visited a church and it's your first time, and a lot of churches are still not meeting at 100% capacity because of COVID. Um, or your church was in the newspaper three times in the last week for Easter. <laughs> all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, you know, you uh, you you run into a, a concern there. So um, moving on. Okay, so number five, schedule individuals with a hierarchy of command uh, to ro rotate inside or outside of the building. Um, one of the reasons that I, I kind of thought through this was because um, if you have individuals that can get easily tired or worn out from doing a specific post, if you choose to set up posts, um, like I try and rotate folks in and out of the parking lot. So, cause I know sometimes if it's a normal Sunday, it can be a parking lot can be kind of boring to go to church and stream the service and sit out in your car. Um, but that being said, you know, I do have just as many folks that want to do a specific post and uh, are great at it. So, you know, why would I um, like I have one gentleman that yells at me when I don't schedule him outside in the parking lot. <laughs> so if he's good with it, I'm good with it. That's his ministry. That's his way of serving. He, he listens to the. The, uh, the message being live streamed on YouTube or Facebook on his phone, and he he uh, patrols the parking lot. So, um, I love it. Go ahead, Mike. There's, there's a quick opportunity I think here is not only to think about it from a standpoint of how many services do you have, how many positions do you have to cover, and what does your coverage look like. Now we try to 
get everybody on the team to worship one, serve one at least. And that way they're, they're getting fed and they're, they're not fully active, but sometimes it doesn't always fully work for coverage on certain weeks. So we are at least cognizant of the fact that we're trying to say, okay, who actually served a position in the sanctuary versus who didn't. And so it's a matter of saying, okay, between first and second services, this, this is the crew we have for both. Let's make sure that positionally we're assigning them so that they're still at least inside at versus outside. And that can be not just physically outside the actual building, but also could be the lobby. Could be, is that person over in our kids' church? Is that person? And, and it's thinking ac- about that across the board. But again, sure. hierarchy of command, understand who, who owns the scene if something were to, to happen. Who's sure. in charge for that service? They may not be the leader of the team. I mean, there's times like, for example, I, I was not at every single service gasp on Easter. But at the same point, it just was I, I needed coverage. OK, yeah. so at that point, you're assigned and, and we, we assign uh, leaders for individual services. Well, there's also rotation. So rotating people, not just so that it, they don't get stale or that it's too much at one point. Or sure. if you have an older member of your team that can't necessarily, you know, stand post well, maybe you rotate them through a spot that there's a stool mm-hmm. over there and they can still keep their eyes and the head on the swivel and, and you know, what, be a, an assistance to the team, even if they can't necessarily be fully mobile 100 percent of the time. And, and this kind of goes in, into a little bit of 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 number nine um, based from what you said, Mike. But honestly, um you know, be encouraging, find something that that person can do in a, in a way that they can serve that's beneficial. Maybe it's creating a new position for that person. But if you're not, you know, if that person is, is wanting to serve um, and, you know, they're, they're a solid individual, you know, find, find something, find some creative way to, to get them involved and get them serving. Um, all right. Just a quick a quick comment on that before we jump on. I, yeah. I've had two really fascinating things bubble up out of my team recently. People are coming to me and and I'm kind of a lieutenant within the structure. And a guy a guy said something to me that I'm like, why didn't I think of that? He goes, you know, the odds are if we have a fire, it'll be a vehicle fire. So we thought about just taking a fire extinguisher out and, and putting it in the parking lot. And I was like, that's a really good idea. And I tell my guys, I'm like, um, currently my entire parking lot team is guys and uh, the ladies want to serve in, inside the venue where it's nice and climate controlled is generally what happens inside of our, inside of our church. But what really cracks me up is people will, um, they will say things um, and bubble up ideas to me. One guy, he's like, Hey, I noticed that sometimes it seems like on big Sundays, you carry a blue backpack. And I'm like, yeah, it's got a bunch of medical in in case somebody gets hurt. And he goes, well, they're actually wanting me as medical to go join the parking lot team. I said, I would kill, no, I mean, slight pun intended there, to have medical in the parking lot at all times, trained medical in the parking lot at all times. And uh, it's funny because people like I've got this guy that he's not sure our church should have a safety team. And he comes up Easter Sunday and he goes, what's in your backpack? And I said, 90% medical. And he goes, and he walked away because you can tell he's like, what's the other 10%? And I didn't answer. Well, it's a couple of candy bars and a water, but there might be some other stuff in there. But it was just one of those things that cracked me up. But those two things that my guys bubbled up to me, I was like, uh, that's brilliant. Um, and I've given ideas to my team and said, hey, what do you think about this? And had them go, let's not run those people up aisle one. Let's push them over two. And that'll help traffic flow that way. And I'm like, sold. And we go do these things. And this is where y- y'all's book comes into place with building a culture in your team because – you're, you're building something that everybody feels like they have input and they have involvement. So, so uh, shameless plug for your book, but it comes back to you're building these relationships inside the building, outside the building. And you want your people, if there's a DLR, you don't want them to go, well, is Paul going to make fun of me if it turns out to be nothing? That's why people don't call 911. Like I straight up told a guy the other day, he goes, well, I'm afraid if I called 911, they'd laugh at me. I said, this is not going to sound very nice, but I can promise you they will not laugh at you while you're on the phone. And he's like, okay, fair enough. I said, they will wait till you hang up. 
if I uh, if I was at your church, Paul, I would laugh at you. Without <laughs> I'd be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break, and then uh, we'll come back to, and, and finish up the other other five things. So stay with us. We'll be right back with you. Cool. Church Safety Guys is a nonprofit organization dedicated to help inspire, influence, and impact church safety and security teams. We are about all things church safety and security, which starts with a ministry mindset and a servant's heart. We're protectors, guardians, ambassadors, and shepherds. We help church and place of worship safety and security teams all over the United States through our broadcasts, online communities, conferences, trainings, resources, and products. Help us reach more churches in impactful ways by considering becoming a monthly ministry partner. $2, $5, $20 a month will help us continue to provide these resources. Okay, so welcome back. It's a quick break. And uh, if you just joined us, you're listening to the Sunday Night Broadcast of the Church Safety Guys. Uh, for additional resources on your for your church safety and security team, visit churchsafetyguys.com. And uh, for a listing of, of past broadcasts, you're welcome to, to find uh, information on them there as well. Uh, tonight's broadcast is a little bit different. Uh, we are going over a little bit longer than we normally do. Uh, we're trying to cover the 10 steps of starting a team uh, because we've had a lot of new folks join the group lately and a lot of folks have reached out to us and, and just asked us uh, the dynamics on, on how we would start a team. Um, and so this isn't by any stretch of the imagination inclusive. I'm sure that at some point in time, you know, somebody will be like, hey, you guys didn't talk about that item. And if you have any questions about the content, you're welcome to uh, email Paul Buckner at P Buckner. No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to email Paul. Um, but we're trying to, to trying to systematically go through this. If you missed uh, tonight's broadcast or you want a paper copy, PDF copy, please feel free to email me. I would be happy to get you one. Uh, it is included in the latest. Uh, edition of the case for church safety and security. So if you haven't purchased that uh, or you would like a copy, I think we still have a couple of donor copies. Feel free to reach out. We'll, we'll try and get you one as well. So number six, it needs no introduction, at least to Paul. So I think Mike <laughs> and I can just talk about it and then we'll skip forward. Sounds so, good. No, I'm kidding. So number six, plane and train. Plan and train. Sorry, um, play, 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 and play, play, play. Where are the train. automobiles, so we James? Too. Where are the automobiles? <laughs> so, um, you know, we've we've no we've we've had this discussion before many 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 times on our broadcast, but um, it's no stranger to us. Most most incidents, if I can speak, are far more medically related than anything else. Absolutely. And so while um, you know, while we've seen across all of our churches, we've seen security instances increase. Um, it's a medical instance or a medical situation is going to encourage far more engagement with an individual than a typical um, doesn't look right or, or security concern that we just watch and observe. Not that it's any less important because it's not. Uh, but what I usually... Uh, usually encourages plan and review church leadership policy and opinion on various topics. Um, and that's where you can get into training with firearms and what's preferred and what's not preferred. Um, because going back up to the communication piece, if you don't have an outline of what's acceptable, you don't want to invest a lot of time in training and trying to get everybody trained a certain way and then find out that the leadership isn't on board with that. You know, you can spend an enormous amount of time, money, and resources training somebody on less lethal 
um, uses of force items like a taser or uh, OC or firearms or, or even, you know, using tourniquets and bandages and that stuff. And um, then you, I mean, it'd be horrible to spend two days training on how to use OC and then the, the church be like, we're not using OC. And then you're like, <laughs> so, but go ahead, Mike. Well, and, and this is obviously should be something that is thought about well in advance of sure. hiring any consultant. Um, there are a lot of great consultants. We have partners that, that certainly sponsor our show and, and there's other great ones out there that aren't yet sponsors. Knock, knock. Hey, <laughs> come check us out. Uh, <laughs> but at the same point, the, it, it's really one of those things that it's not just the job of that consultant to come tell you how you should do things at your church. It's Excellent your pastors. Point. And so find out from your pastors, what is possible, pliable, viable, whatever you want to look at it as and start there. And then when you hire a consultant, let them know where those guardrails are, because those guardrails are first and foremost, your church. And regardless of the bona fides of that consultant, your church has a policy and that policy is that, and they can either assist and train within those confines or hire a different consultant. For sure. And that's, that is definitely one thing to, to look at as well. You know, where, where's the scope of, uh, the individual that's offering that training, what, are, you know, what is their, their background and their expertise? Um, you know, I would not train someone I trained, I've trained myself with OC and pepper spray and I've taken classes, et cetera, but I would not feel comfortable training my team on that as much as I have knowledge on, on that topic. I don't feel comfortable training them. I would have another person come in and train them. Um, just the liability. Right. Absolutely. So from, from that standpoint, for sure. Paul, what were you going to throw in there? Well, I've got a direct follow for that and then kind of an offshoot, but I think it's, I think it's important. So, uh, number one, when you're when you're coming up with your use of force continuums, there are, churches are very uh, polarized on this on the topic of OC spray in the sanctuary or whatever. Um, and I, I don't really care the person's stance, but it, it's something to be aware of. I know of a police officer that the OC spray actually ate the contact lenses on his eyeballs, and he accidentally got sprayed by his partner and. These are guys who are trained in this, who are certified in this. And so I wouldn't just casually carry it. I would I would get the training and actually practice with the item so you don't accidentally spray yourself in the face with it. But they had to take him to the hospital and they used, like they laid him down and they scraped the plasticky residue off of his eyes. Thank you. Exactly, James. And he <laughs> said, that's the second time that's happened to me. And I'm like... Wow, uh, this is an offshoot, but I think this is important. So we all think about, and, and I never thought about this until today on the drive home, but we think about calling an ambulance because somebody collapsed or somebody got injured at church. Maybe there was a use of force and somebody's actually bleeding or something. But it, it, I'm going to just throw this out there for the community to mull over. It may be a good idea to call an ambulance, whether you see somebody who's visibly got injuries or not, um, I was talking to a police officer today that 20 years ago, um, he and two other officers were fighting a guy who was high on drugs and the guy's heart was, was just jackhammering as fast as it could. And this guy fought them and fought them and threw them around like rag dolls and died. When they did the coroner's report, they said the bottom of his heart exploded. Huh. And the reason I share that is I know another officer at a department that he was by himself and was fighting for uh, his life against a guy, got him in handcuffs, was holding him down. It took three men and a taser to get him in the car. And after they handed him off to the hospital, this guy's it's 25 minutes later, the guy coded and they had to like, they're starting chest compressions and whatever else to get the guy back. And I understand that the guy lived um, now, now, from a completely logistical, I mean, like a, a liability standpoint, now that was the hospital's problem. But these people are doing drugs, and I, and I hope it never comes into our church. But I'm just going to throw this out there. When you're thinking about medical and you're thinking about calling 911, 
maybe the guy that helps you wrestle the guy to the floor has a heart attack, James, like what happened at your church five minutes after he helps. And they tell us, and James, you're an instructor in this, they tell us that if, you've, if you're in a use of force situation, ask for two ambulances or more, one for the person that attacked you and yeah. one for you. This is a very common teaching. And so I was driving home and I was thinking a guy's heart exploded because he went into a rage and attacked three cops. And a guy coded in a hospital and from a from a and I'm just going to throw this out there. And uh, but from a, a liability and our Christian walk standpoint, I think it's something to discuss with our teams, with our leadership, even with our insurance companies and say, you know, maybe this needs to be SOP at our church is if we call 911 for somebody to be arrested or there's been an altercation, maybe we need to ask for an ambulance. And I mean, I mean, how many times has there been an incident at a facility, a concert and something happens and then somebody has a heart attack because their heart was weak? You know, we, we had a train wreck just down the street from me and a guy died the next day because he was walking around looking at all the damage to his property and his heart gave out. So I don't have an answer well, to that. I'm just, yeah, loving it. I don't, I know like for, for Columbus, a lot of times, um, if it's an, and, and we've, I know we, we have talked about this on a broadcast before and we could talk about it again, but if it's an ALS or advanced life support call, typically like where somebody would be having chest pains or heart condition or something like that, difficulty breathing, um, they usually dispatch an engine and an ambulance. So they have additional personnel. A lot of times if they have folks, um, and this would apply to most major, major, larger, you know, larger areas. Um, if they have extra folks, a lot of times they'll dispatch officers um, that have first aid equipment or they'll dispatch like a battalion chief um, that might have, you know, ALS or additional equipment on, on his, um, on his vehicle. But yeah, you're one of the, one of the listeners commented, you can always cancel a responding vehicle, but you can't make up time. That's absolutely right. And, you know, I would rather if you see a team member on that part, whether it's training or in a, an actual event that is struggling, uh, it's a good time to kind of pull them to the side and say, you know, OK, are, are you doing all right? Maybe take a set of vitals, um, you know, and have somebody checked out. And of course, the natural reaction for folks is going to be, no, I'm fine. I, I don't you know, I'm good. But the reality is that um, most people that are in a medical situation don't want to acknowledge that they're having issues at that point because of the embarrassment and and everything else. So I don't know who mentioned that, James, points. but that's a gold nugget. So so kudos to whoever is is listening at home and, and enjoying the home game. Um, <laughs> I I love the fact that they said that because. That is what that's where I was going with that. And you just encapsulated that is you can't make up for lost time. And right. so if you if you ask for an ambulance and, and we may not even know we're injured. I mean, that's the thing about a life well, or death situation. If you, you go. Have, yeah. If you go hands on with someone, you could very easily be stabbed or cut or, um, you know, I've seen situations and I know you have too, Paul, where. Um, officers have even been shot and not realized that they were shot because their adrenaline was was running so high and they had vests on or, you know, protective gear, et cetera. So I'm going to toss it over to Mike. So number seven is kind of a twofer. There's two parts there. Uh, first, uh, um, I'll, I'll go with the second part of it, is uh, reviewing your state laws pertaining to church safety and security. I know a big difference. I, I moved from Massachusetts to Texas, and there's a lot of differences between Massachusetts and Texas. Um, <laughs> but also specifically wearing, to church safety. I mean, they actually address you're wearing things. wearing a cowboy hat now. I think that's I a little bit different than New England. I'm just got my boot. Yeah, yeah. And saying y'all. Uh, yeah. uh, anyhow. The, uh, but there is differences in, in church safety and legalities and how that's addressed. And uh, sure. for, for example, uh, for the longest time, you couldn't even necessarily call yourself a security team unless you were trained and licensed by the state. Now, there's a fine line. There's actually a law in Texas that did change. And in theory, you could call yourself a security team um, as a church. Uh, but we, we actually chose to stay on the correct side of that and just retitled ourselves the safety team. 
And obviously safety is much broader than just security anyway, and tends to be a, a heavy part of the focus. But the second part of seven, and I'm going to throw it over to Paul, is establishing a relationship and partnering with your local law enforcement. Amen. Wait, he doesn't know anything about that topic. <laughs> so we're going to jump on to number eight. <laughs> Uh, there's so much there that's awesome. Um, you want first responders in <laughs> you want first responders in your church. You you want firefighters and EMTs and paramedics and nurses and doctors. Um, you want these people that have these skill sets because they can help you in those moments, those low probability, high high liability, high danger situations. But when you have law enforcement in your church and you build relationships with them, I had multiple off-duty LEOs come up to me today. Hey, Paul. Hey, Buckner. How's it going? Wave at me from across the parking lot. I had one roll down his window and yell at me uh, Easter because he couldn't get anywhere near me with the crowd. Those relationships not only bless you and, and, and if they're not believers, they can find Christ. It's not only an outlet for them to realize that not everybody in the world is insane and has warrants. But the intel you can get, and I'm just going to go really quickly because, James, you were talking about being able to just unpack something for the better part of an hour. So you want them in your parking lot. You want relationships with them. You want officers that know how to clear your building. So when the alarm goes off at 2 o'clock in the morning, they know the layout of your building. They need to know your emergency contacts. Um, they need to know who the people are that go to your church uh, in case they find somebody there. Um, and then having them there by the door. And then just the intel you can get from them. I literally have had officers say, hey, that guy got arrested last week. Somebody said something he didn't like, so he pepper sprayed him. So this guy's going to go off half cocked. Yeah. You I, know? I was just, just going to say, j just, the, just the thing you mentioned on um, them not knowing the layout of your building, that's massive. Because there have been times, in fact, around around Christmas, I think it was, um, I was responding to my building, and uh, and you guys know this story. There was a, a homeless guy broke in to the the church, and I got the alarm calls, and one of our staff members, you know, kind of um, felt felt threatened by him, and so I was on my way to the church, and I called the police, and I said, and they're like, okay, you're we're going to meet you there to help you. You know, what door are you at? What's your vehicle look like? Where do you, where are our officers going to meet you for this threat? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, meet me at this door, this location on this side of the building that I have a white, you know, white Chevy Silverado come to the door. I will let you in. And if I don't let you in, there's a problem and you need to, to gain entrance to the building. And so you know, from that standpoint, absolutely. We assume that they know what buildings look like on the inside. And I can tell you after 57 or almost, well, I'll just say after 50 years of construction projects in our church, <laughs> <laughs> I get confused sometimes of where I am and how I'm walking through the building and, and all well, that and, fun and stuff. You, so. you make a great point. And I, I want to circle back around and have you talk about this because not only does not law enforcement need to know what the inside of your church looks like, but they need to train in your church. If you have an opportunity, yeah. and, and I want to come back to that in a minute and have you talk about that, James, but they need to be able to train in your church. And some of our churches, to James's point about construction projects, are mazes, and they're more like a, a video game for a first-person shooter than, than what you would lay out for a modern building. And I, I went to a church the other day, and if, and if you're watching this, you know who you are. He's got an amazing church about an hour from me. That place clearing and holding that church in an emergency would be a nightmare. There are places that walk over above your head and come around. There's things that come around multiple ways towards the stage. And if a bad guy knew anything about the layout of our churches after we've done, you know, 50 billion uh, add-ons to our churches, um, they could sneak back around, and that is a that is a uh, a law enforcement team's nightmare. I mean, you, I, I was telling a, a friend of mine in law enforcement about this particular church. It's a great church, but it's it's been built onto so many times. I said you literally have to clear it with one guy walking backwards to cover yeah. you the whole time because you could not clear and hold that place. And uh, so that was one thing. And then you want to build 
such close relationships with law enforcement that James, back to your point, that when law enforcement rolls up, they look at you and go, all right, Mike, what do we got? And they look at you and go, okay, James, you're with me because they know you have the keys. They know you know the alarm codes. They know you know where things are in the building. And I don't know how many times I cleared my church with law enforcement. And I would say you could hide underneath that. That classroom comes back and doubles back around and it's actually got two doors. And I would do that to the point that I've, I've cleared my church in a flying wedge at the front of the wedge where guys would come up and be like, you've got point roll. And they knew I would take them through the church. And then we've had people that were high as a kite on campus. And I had law enforcement get out of their car and point at me and go, what have we got? You're a point of contact. They know they can trust you. They've built a relationship. That's how I became a chaplain was, was building relationships with officers like that. So James, talk a little bit, would you please? Yeah, well, I'm just just going back to what I mentioned earlier. When I when I was on the phone with the dispatcher, they asked me. They're like, "Okay, what what door, uh, you know, do you want us to meet you at?" Well, um, two or three years ago, we labeled, uh, alphabetized all of all of the doors on the outside with reflective um, tape. I think one of the members in in our church created them with her cricket. Um, and or cry cut or however you want to say that the the crafting thing um different parts of the country say different things i know but we labeled all the doors and it wasn't until that time and i had been going to the church for uh, probably over 10 years and i didn't realize how many doors there were until we started you know alphabetizing every one now we're still working on that but you want to do the outside so people can see it and then the inside is good if there's smoke because the reflective will actually cut through the smoke. So, and the other the other point to that is if you're on the inside, when you're calling 911, your adrenaline is so high that often you can't remember where you are or what you're doing. And so being able to, when they say, okay, where do we go? Hey, I'm looking up at this door. This door says D. Okay, okay can you come to door D? Um, that's extremely helpful as well. I've made the call before and I've, you know, I'm the safety director and uh, I've been there for almost 15 years and I've made the call before and the dispatcher says, what's your street address, sir? And I'm like, Boop. like, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, um, uh, oh, awkward <laughs> silence. Oh yeah. You know, and then I tell him the address. So just because you just because you've trained and that's the other thing to, to keep in mind and not beat yourself up over but just because you've trained doesn't mean that adrenaline can't impact your functions your motor functions and what you're doing and how you respond and, and act so well, before we throw this to mike especially if you're injured right if you're injured right. now it compounds it and so Murphy's law, uh, you know, if I'm the most squared away person on that shift, which if that's the case, we're all in trouble. But if I'm the most squared away person on that shift, I will be the one laying here like this. And then, you know, and that's why we want to spread that knowledge and make sure people know things and the team can function without us in a pinch. Um, because if I'm unconscious or I'm in heaven. The great thing about uh the labeling of the doors, not only is it aid in the arrival of those partner agencies uh, that you've built those relationships with and hopefully have practiced, but it, it's good for kind of uh, overall zone mapping really of your own building. Now, not all of us necessarily have a, a six, seven building campus and we're not necessarily all, some of us have a simple box. Uh, some of us have a simple box with many, many doors though. And so with that, each of those doors not only provides a entry point for those uh, agencies, but it's also a great spot to say, hey, so-and-so, I, I need you to go to door three on the Bravo side, or I need you to go to this spot. It's a great orientation map uh, for a team to kind of say, instead of, hey, I need you to go down right over on the uh, uh, second section on this side, no, go towards this door and I'll, I'll rendezvous with you there. And then we yeah. can talk off comms or something like that quickly because it's a quick touch point of, hey, I want you to go sit behind this guy right here. I'm not going to yeah. say that while I'm standing watching them five feet away. So those sorts of things that you want to kind of do. But the, the the grid pattern can help you with that labeling. For sure. Nice. 
So moving on to number eight, um, record data on incidents and start off slow. Paul kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. I know I've talked about it. Um, you know, if, if you need help um, trying to set something up on uh, like Google Forms or, or doing something like that, it doesn't have to be complicated. It, it's very simple. And, um, you know, you're welcome to reach out to one of the three of us and, you know, we'll take some time and either show you how we do it or, um, you know, we'd be happy to, to help you set something up. But even if you don't want to do what happens, what happens for us is when we do a Google form, um, when we any type of incident, we fill out detailed information. And then when an individual, whether it's myself or someone else hits submit, um, I get a copy of it immediately. And the oversight pastor gets a copy of it immediately and he goes through it. And if there's a serious incident or concern, he either one follows up with the family of the incident, um, which is a great best practice. You know, if, even if it's just a child that fell and got hurt, okay, Monday morning, how's that child doing? You know, let's follow up, just make sure. Um, I recommend that the, the pastors, the church full-time staff do that, not you uh, for liability reasons, because you don't want to commit the, the church to something um, for, for sake of safety. But um, when, and if it's a serious thing with that, with what happened for us, the oversight pastor will call me and he'll say, Hey, you want to run me through what happened? Cause I'm going to do a meeting with the other, you know, other pastors and, and this might come up. So I like to, to be very specific in the incident reports. Um, but the, the biggest thing going back to number one that Paul mentioned earlier is when you record data, even if it seems silly, you come you compile that data and you send that data i i did it every six months to all of the church leaders and said hey this is what the ministry is doing this is what we're seeing these are trends these are not trends that built in itself more credibility to a need and more uh, financial support uh, from from having a budget to needing a budget to seeing what is really going on behind the scenes than any conversation I could have had over a course of three or four years. Yep. So keep that in mind um, <clears throat> with all the form creating platforms that are out there today, it's super easy um, and you really, you can't go wrong um, putting something together. So it's, it's important too, I think to, to also factor in that, not everything needs to be a super detailed form. Now, obviously, sure. if there's an incident, if there's a medical component, if there's a transfer to a hospital, if there's a slip and trip, all those things obviously need a certain degree of documentation. Right. But there's there's an ability to use Google Forms or others just to capture intel. And right. this thing happened. It didn't rise to the level of an incident, but this is what we observed. This is how we acted. And this is what we think we might do in the future. So it, yeah. those sorts of things can be not only great to capture for data points, again, even if they didn't rise to the level of a full-fledged incident. But what's great is when you sit down with your team, hopefully monthly, but if, ideally if you have to quarterly, go back through those simple reports that were submitted and now review those and say, all right, maybe there's a nugget in there that you can say, in this particular incident, let's spend five, 10 minutes unpacking that. Let's talk sure. about that specific case. It's a great, it's great fodder for table topping. It's great ideas that you can now say, well, if it had gone this way, how might we have re responded? If it occurred over in this part of the building, would we have treated that differently? And if so, how? So there's a lot of good information that you can capture if you just take three minutes to literally fill out a form. Our, one of the things to that uh, circle back around and uh, one of the gals watching actually just had a, a question that, that I wanted to answer on that. Um, but one of the things is um, you're absolutely right, Mike. We actually we divide it into two things, an incident and an investigation. OK, an investigation. Our investigation paperwork is about eight pages long. And that's when something happened. And that's when we need to get witness statements and we're doing an official formal investigation in a, in a specific situation. But yeah, the, um, the Google forms, I can't show you on my phone cause I'm using my phone as my web camera tonight, 
But uh, the Google Forms doc, I've got it saved when I open up Safari because I use Apple products. Um, when I when I click on Safari, it pops up and it shows an icon where I can click on it. It goes straight to that Google Forms link and I can fill out the incident report. And it literally takes me less than two minutes. And I've got I've, I have it set up where I've got drop downs of who was there based on my team in a place where you can report stuff and who's taking the report and stuff like that. But um, if you go uh, for those listening, if you go to the church safety and security uh, group on Facebook under the files tab, um, there is a ton of stuff, um, incident documents, investigation forms, all that stuff that has been put in there free. Uh, you're welcome to use that and, um, you know, uh, start start uh yeah exactly nobody has to reinvent the wheel there's some great questions in there uh but again that's another thing if if someone needs help with we can we can jump in so um i'm going to jump over to to nine and ten and for sake of time we'll we'll kind of combine those um because i know we're we are running kind of over tonight but um you know, number nine is be encouraging to others. We've talked about that. Support the folks that are volunteering and serving and invest in them. Um, and then number 10 is invest into the future of, of your people. Um, mentally, physically, spiritually, um, that was one of the, the reasons that pushed uh, Mike and I to do the, the church safety and security life cycle series. Um, that's one of the reasons that it pushed me to try and do devotionals. Uh, because I just didn't see content out there. Um, there's a great content on topics on leadership, et cetera, and, you know, being aware and in church safety and security, but I didn't see anything where it was like meat and potatoes to say, look, this is how we continue to keep our team engaged. And this is how we invest back into, into those that are serving with us. And then so, the difference, and I could probably spend another hour talking about that. <laughs> Shameless sure. plug: We have a, a book on servant leadership coming out May first in another month, and that's the first book in the the um, church safety and security life cycle series. Um, but honestly, the difference between a ministry and a job is discipleship, and the the difference between. Um, being a ministry and being a security guard is investing into the lives of the people that volunteer and serve with you and, um, you know, ensuring and investing in the folks that come to, to church and, and serve, you know, be a part of other ministries. So, um, Paul, you wanted to throw something in there? Yeah. So anybody listening at home, that's not familiar when James and Mike are writing these books, it's, uh, and James has got other books out there already, but these these uh, books, the proceeds go to bless small churches and help them get training and materials. So none of us have a vacation home in Tahiti uh, or anything like that. And as as nice <laughs> as nice as that might be, but um, okay, so, I guess we need to sell that timeshare, right? <laughs> uh, but it's one of those things that if you're looking for a resource you're spending on money on something that's actually going to bless you, bless your church, and it's going to turn around and it's going to bless other churches. This side of eternity, you won't even know. So that's one of the really cool things. And then uh, when we're do doing that discipleship within our team, I had a guy turn to me today and he wanted to go for a walk. He knows that I do one security sweep at a certain time and the pastors have figured this out and they've asked me to get a, a count of empty parking spots and they can figure out how many vehicles are there based on that. So they're like, you're going to do a security sweep anyway. Could you do it during the second service? And so that's the one that has the most people. So they're like, yay, we don't have to do it. So I, I do one of these walks, had a great conversation with a new member of my team, uh, life and church and the sermon, a bunch of different things. And we're walking around the outside of the building. We, and we did an extra long one because the conversation walked him back to his truck. As I get back inside, another gentleman walks up to me and is like, hey, and he wanted to go on the security sweep with me because he had something to talk about. Well, I had enough people on deck. I just did another one. And I love that moment because you're investing back into your people and they need those relationships. And I think it's easy for us to forget. We may be, especially right now, the only real human contact they had this week. Like we may be it. 
I have clients that that ha had not left their home, stepped off their property for almost a calendar year. And finally, one of them looks at me. He's like, Paul, if Jesus wants me, he can have me. I'm going back to my life. And uh, I, I, I kind of chuckled, but how terrible. So keeping that in mind. And then, and then Mike? Yeah, I, I think to kind of tie all this in a bow, because we've kind of hit the 10. But if, if we look across the, the, the pattern here, one of the things is, it, again, we are in a ministry. We are investing in people. And those people are what make up our team, and we serve other people in our church. We need right. to make sure that we're not just encouraging them, we're not just engaging them, we're empowering them, and understand that, again, because they're people, they can have a bad day too. And so sometimes it's about renewal and giving that person a chance to have a break. Sometimes it's pulling them aside, and you know what? You should be praying with your team every Sunday anyway, but maybe that person needs a little bit more. OK, so make sure we're investing in them and make sure you take the mental health of your team seriously. A morning like today where everybody's on edge and elevated into orange. You know what? That's important, not just to debrief for the purposes of retention of that knowledge. It's to check on people. How do they sure. feel coming out of that? What, what are they going through? Because not everybody has been through a situation like that. Not everybody's going to react the same way. We need to focus on putting effort into making sure we renew our team members so they keep coming back and continuing to serve. Amen. That they want to come back and serve. Exactly. For sure. So wrapping, uh, wrapping things up. And that was an, an excellent, um, an excellent way to do that. And we go, we actually do go into more detail on that with the engage train and retain book that, uh, that Mike and I put together and we have additional, uh, resources that will be coming out later uh, this year that connect to that uh, for small group, group studies, uh, et cetera, for uh, those of you that want to do that with your, with your team. Um, the 10 steps to starting a church safety or security team, what we've talked about tonight uh, is available in new editions or new copies of um, the case for church safety and security. We just updated that and did a revised copy. So if you'd like to take a look at that, you're welcome to. Um, if you need a copy of that, we have churches that do reach out to us and, and we're blessed um, by them donating uh, so that we can send copies to other people, other churches and other resources. So uh, if it's something where you need a copy because you'd like to pass it on to your, your pastor, your church leadership, please reach out to us because we would love to try and get you a copy and we'll do that as soon as we can. Um, for those of you that already have the book and just want a, a PDF of what we talked about tonight, um, the 10 steps, uh, please reach out to us and, and I will shoot you that PDF and, um, then you can, you can download it and, and, uh, and take a look at it more thoroughly. We certainly, we didn't cover every single thing verbatim, um, <laughs> but that would probably take another two or three hours and, and we've already, <laughs> we've already exceeded our welcome. Um, but I will, I will say that, um, Next week, we are actually off. We've got some stuff going on, um, so it was just easier for the three of us to not be on. Um, the following week, on April 25th, um, one of the things that we have been focused on trying to do is to bring content um, to not only strengthen you and your team, but to help strengthen you um, as a believer and, and for the leaders that are watching. And so uh, a good friend of mine uh, by the name of Carl Kirby, um, is going to be joining us on the 25th. Carl is a great guy. He is actually one of the uh, founding board members for Answers in Genesis. And uh, I'm going to play a quick video of him and his resources so you guys can um, can take a look at that. Uh, but he is excited about joining us uh, in two weeks and has got some great information on discipleship and leadership. So I'm going to play that and then we'll be right back with you.
Hi, Carl Kirby with Reasons for Hope. Can't wait to be with you guys. I would like to encourage you to go to our website, rforh.com, to get more information about what we're going to be doing. But I can tell you this, when we come, we make it simple, we make it straightforward, and we deal with real world issues. So if you are struggling with your faith, if you've got friends that are struggling with their faith, come, bring them. I love to just engage folks, so come early, I'll be there. Engage me in question and answer because we want the body of Christ to be encouraged. We want those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ to know that they can trust Him and His Word. So, I hope to see you soon. Make sure to check us out at rforh.com. Great. So uh, visit that website, check him out. He has got some great uh, videos. He's on, on, um, he speaks at churches. So if your church is interested in hosting him, he's very much into apologetics and he runs a series called Debunked. And it's like a three to four minute um, video on, uh, that are free. They're on his website, but uh, it's like a devotional video where, uh, it just goes through different things that that uh, believers ask, different questions that believers ask, and he explains it in a very unique and creative way. So I would encourage you, if you're looking for, for something as a devotional or maybe to open, hey, three or four minute message, you could open you know, your Sunday morning with that. Get your team together, play one of these quick, quick videos and, and pray, and then jump into service. So... Check out his website, and like I said, he'll be on on the 25th, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to chatting with him again. So mm-hmm. um, other than that, I'm going to ask Paul to, to close us out in prayer, and then mm-hmm. we will let you guys go. All right. So. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunities to learn. Uh, Lord God, you you give us warnings and and we get to learn from other people's experiences. Lord God, I thank you that everything went well uh, with Mike's church, that you that you were there and you watched over their church. And Lord God, I ask that you would have, as always, this broadcast or podcast, whatever iteration of this is out there to reach the right ears. Lord God, it's it's amazing and humbling when people reach out and say, Lord God, that th- this helped me win. And Lord God, I ask that you would help it to reach the right ears, that, that people would hear and, and see and heed, Lord God. We're to be as innocent as doves, but as shrewd as vipers, Lord God. We've got to be careful and protect the flocks that you've given us charge of. We thank you. We give you the honor and the glory in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So thanks for joining us tonight. As always, you can visit churchsafetyguys.com for additional information or resources. And if we can be of any assistance to you or your team, please feel free to reach out. Um, Even if it's a simple prayer request, I love the fact that we do occasionally get emails from churches where folks will say, hey, could you just pray for me? I'm going to talk to, you know, my church leadership about this Mm -hmm. this week. So that encourages and blesses me, uh, and we're certainly available to do that uh, for you guys. So take care, have a blessed week, and we will actually see you in two weeks with Carl. So thanks for watching, guys. Take care. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you for joining the Church Safety Guys broadcast. We hope that you found it informative, and we appreciate your feedback. Looking for ways you can help us reach more churches? Share our broadcast with your teams. Consider becoming a monthly ministry partner. Like and share our page and join the discussion in our Facebook groups. Visit our website at churchsafetyguys.com for other great resources. Remember to keep a servant's heart, a mindset of ministry, and semper disciplina. Always be training. Have a blessed week.